Um, Dr. Stephen Lehman is an educator, research, author, and designer. He's the director of UNLV School of Architecture and a tenured full professor of architecture. He is also the CEO of Future Cities Leadership Lab. Before joining UNLV, Stephen Lehman was the chairholder of the UNESCO's Chair for Sustainable Urban Development for the Asian Pacific region. In his talk, he will explore how existing cities can be transformed into low carbon urban systems and design strategies for sustainability uh, or sustainable cities. Dr. Lehman will now share his slides and begin his talk. Thank you again so much. Thanks, Sarah, for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm supposed to talk about the future. Uh, can, you, can you all hear me? That's good, because I can't see you. It's, uh, it's quite amazing, the logistics of getting this up. <laughs> I'm supposed to talk about the future, how we will live more resource efficient, and how cities are becoming more resilient. And I will do this it's through the medium of architecture. <clears throat> it's such an honor to be able to speak to you all. And I want this to be an informal talk. Uh, over the next 30 minutes, I will fly through some slides and then you, of course, can ask questions. Um, let me first frame the topic. Architecture and urban design is an unbelievably slow art. Everything takes from design to completion at least six or 10 years. And the creative design process in urban design is not a linear process. It is often nonlinear and it demands some notion of inquiry. I would think it's a generative process. And I understand architecture as a culture, not just as a profession. It contributes to the culture of our society and cities are probably humanity's greatest achievement. So architecture helps us to define where we stand ultimately. And I believe our agenda has never been this clear with the Paris Agreement, the Sustainable Development Goals, the agenda for energy transition and so on. So it's, very, it's a very relevant question. How are cities confronting the challenges posed by warming climate and also, um, of course, by the recent health crisis? And I've been involved with my team in trying to answer this question for a long time, trying to understand how cities work, creating a science of cities. And I have been able to explore this as a teacher, as an educator at different leading universities in the UK, in Australia, and now in Nevada. And we have, lo looked, we have looked for quite some time at sustainable cities and resilience over the last 20 years, long before it became fashionable. So sustainability requires us to think holistically and to understand how things are interconnected uh, within cities. And I'm now going forward to share my screen. Um, I assume I'm sharing the screen now? Okay, so, okay, so let's go on. We don't see it yet, Stefan. Okay, you don't see the screen. Why don't you see the screen? Um, share the screen again, share. There we go, it's working now. And is it big enough? Um, go ahead and start your presentation. Yeah. It's all right? So go ahead and swap displays. Yeah. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So now it's working. Okay. So uh, basically, of course, when we talk about cities here in Nevada, we are amazed by the rapid urbanization of Las Vegas within the last 40, 50 years, growing from basically nothing to 2.2 million people. But also, of course, the growing city of Reno, where most of you are. And when you think about the trick, the large Tahoe Reno Industrial Center that is outside urbanizing the countryside, the enormous industrial facility that the trick is an industrial park, which is itself larger than the city of Reno. It's a kind of typical big box architecture without people. It's the architecture of Amazon, Tesla, Walmart, Apple, Switch, and so on. And the enormous scale and footprint that all these logistic and distribution centers require these kind of buildings are too large for the city and therefore they have to be located in the countryside. So it creates 
a gigantic constellation of abstract nondescript boxes, some over a mile long, and it's not people oriented. Um, and there are almost no people there anyway. We can see here an entire new dimension of architecture that is emerging. The space between those boxes is not public space. We can't really call it public space because it's not occupied by people. It's used by self-driving cars and trucks, and some few buses that deposit the workers there. And the spaces are not occupied by humans. So we have abstract forms inhabiting the landscape. And you cannot call it really a city. Also, the scale of those buildings are, of course, the scale of the city. And the spaces are so vast, there's very few people inhabiting that the urban the urban in Kohlhaas notes that this kind of architecture has never existed before. And Kohlhaas says it is a direct outcome of our current economic organization and values. So it's quite frightening to believe that this might be the future uh, with robots working in gigantic spaces. Here in Las Vegas, we are more concerned about the lack of a real serious gross boundary. There isn't really a serious gross boundary. There is one that doesn't work. And the sprawl at the periphery where the city meets the edge and the desert is quite of concern. Just over the last couple of years, the city has increased its footprint dramatically. And because we are so car dependent, it's of course now coming to an hold. We had a crash recovery the last five years. The city was booming again. And now we it seems like we're having a new crash and a lot of the projects are now canceled or on hold or postponed. This is from an article in the New York Times uh, where it seems Las Vegas is always going from boom to bust more extreme than any other American city. And cities of course grow, cities consume and cities even die. And we have to think of the different concepts of cities and cities as centers of consumption. Cities is where most greenhouse gas emissions are created, where most waste is generated, energy consumed, food consumed, but also water and materials and so on. And they have emerged different types of city concepts. Some call it the resilient city, the circular city, the resource efficient city, the city of short distances, the green city. So all those different concepts are of course interconnected and they're all, if you look at it holistically, are all about the same, the turn, how can we transform the existing city into a more sustainable, more resilient city? And with the sustainable development goals by the United Nations, the 17 broad goals with uh, SDG 11 being the sustainable cities and communities goal, I think again, the agenda is very clear. It's clearer than ever before. It's never been as clear as it is now. Our agenda is there and everybody knows it, but the mindset and behavior needs to change. I see the old mentalities and the number one barrier we have to overcome is the lack of political will and the lack of leadership. That's the big topic, really, the elephant in the room. And we, cr we created the Urban Futures Lab and the Cluster for Sustainable Cities in the US and in the UK to look at that, at that issue and we think cities for the age of global warming and deliver the evidence space for better decision making in the transformation of the American city. So this engages over 40 key researchers. Of course, the science is clear. We have, um, we have more CO2 emissions than ever in the history of the Earth for millions of years and global warming is caused by the trapped in the atmosphere trapping uh, CO2 emissions. And many people pretend as if nothing is happening, even if the planet is burning. Um, we are publishing quite a lot of research on that. We have published, I have published 21 books on that topic and uh, many uh, papers and so have my colleagues and people involved. And some of the key books I wanna just briefly mention is um, the Principles of Green Urbanism or the Low Carbon Cities book or Urban Regeneration book or Growing Compact. And I have restructured the research we do in the university, uh, the School of Architecture, in seven theme-based research concentrations. And our priority is to provide the evidence space for better decision-making on the future of the American city. But of course, many people are asking, is it possible to predict how fast global warming will run off? And what, is, what are those feedback loops? And when is it too late? And how much time is left? 
to act. Where are we now and when might we reach this tipping point of no return? And also there's a lot of talk about flattening the curve of COVID-19. We also still have to flatten the curve of global warming. Business as usual is not gonna do that. We have an overshoot. Uh, we are overreaching the Earth's capacity. And so we need to bring this curve also down. And it's of course very much now uh, connected to the pandemic on the, uh, the health and well-being agenda. And we have learned a lot of important lessons in the last three months through the pandemic. And it's very important to understand the lasting impact and that health and well-being must be a priority for us. Every urban decision should be guided first and foremost by the aim to make us happy and keep us healthy. What's the whole point otherwise? So it's also very timely question as we are facing a major health crisis through the pandemic that is closely intertwined with climate change. And is it likely to have long lasting impacts on the future of cities? Yes, certainly it is. So it's important to learn from what we have discovered the last three months during the pandemic, especially the importance of urban health and related to urban design. Good urban design can make a profound positive contribution in regard to solving these issues and challenges and architecture can make us not just consumers, but it can make us citizens, uh, which is of course uh, very important for us to understand that good architecture can also reduce the operating energy demand, the aborted energy, which reduces carbon emissions. And what have we learned through, through the pandemic? We will see probably a lot of empty office buildings now and the open plan office seems to be passe and homes will be more precious if they have space for remote working home offices. We have access to small gardens, maybe roof gardens, we have balconies, we have windows that connect us to street life, and we will see a comeback of the courtyard building. We also see how restaurants, like in this image here, separate people um, to keep in business and how no, new rules of social interaction change public spaces, like here the example in Italy. Public spaces, of course, we still wanna participate in street life and social activity. And interestingly, London and New York and other major cities are now looking at keeping the areas that they closed off for cars and keep it open for pedestrians and cyclists because that's allowing us to distance and to enjoy urban space. And so those cars might that we banned from areas of the London city center might be banned from in the future there. And of course, it brings us to the question of density. Density is of course very important and the city needs density and density is good because uh, it reduces CO2 emissions, it makes cities walkable, it stimulates economic and social activity, it enables cycling and public transport. But of course, the main issue is not density outside the city, the density inside, inside transport vehicles, inside apartments, overcrowded houses, the internal density of occupation is where there's the biggest problem. We also see changes in retail with online shopping. This has been happening for the last 10 years. And now, of course, it's threatening the city centers all over the world where we see retail not being able to open up again. And mobility is probably the hardest area. You know, what is gonna happen with airports? Are we rethinking and redesigning airports? How can we keep the amount of people in trains and subways and buses low for social distancing? And what is, what is the problem of Isolation, those suburbs, for instance, in the sprawl where we see with social distancing, stay home orders, the loneliness as for the elderly. We need, I believe, new concepts of community that avoid isolation, where we have small apartments, where we have balconies so we can step out in small gardens. This is all very, very crucial. So as you will know, um, there are new rules of interaction in public space. These are the ones issued by the National Association for City Transportation Officials. Very interesting how they imagine outdoor dining or markets and walking and loading and shared streets could happen. But also we have to come back, we have to come back to urban design in our discussion. And cities and buildings are responsible for somewhere between 45 and 60% of all energy use. Two thirds of their emissions are operational carbon. Emissions from materials and construction processes are one third. 
So assuming a lifespan of a building of 30 years, and this is where we can, as architects, as designers, as urban planners, we can reduce the emissions and the performance of architecture is one of the most important topics today. It's about how architecture supports community building and sustainability in its performance. It's, a, it's not about technology per se, it's how we use technology and integrate it to support, to support those two goals, community building and sustainability. And let's come back to the core problem in urban design, the dispersed city, such as Las Vegas, Reno, Phoenix, where we have a city that is, has a huge footprint as an outcome, as a result of outdated planning, of zoning ideas that have led to sprawl and very high car dependency. Almost 35% of all emissions in Southern Nevada are the result from driving around because we are constantly forced to drive. And today we know we cannot have endless urban sprawl. We need to maintain, contain the footprint of the city and say, how big do you want to have the city? Enough is enough, you know. And mass public transport has not received the investment. Other cities like Portland or Seattle have seen. And cycling is not working in Las Vegas because, or in Phoenix, because the distances are far too large for cycling to work and half the year it's too hot. So there's also the issue of values, of course, we have to address and behavior change. The car is king mentality, which rejects the use of buses and other forms of transport. People would not accept to use the buses. They like to sit in their air conditioned car, of course, and one person in a car is of course not very sustainable. So taking out the car from the city center is now a huge discussion in many cities worldwide, especially with the pandemic. For instance, in Spain, in Norway, in the UK, in Denmark, where residents want streets that are more pedestrian friendly, walkable with cleaner air, and less noise, the electric car would be a solution here. So for 70 or 80 years, we have built suburbs like we see here in that image that are monofunctional based on zoning laws that separate housing from working and light industry. What we've done is we put housing over here and working over there and we forced people to commute. So today we are trying to bring those functions back together again and mix them. So we do away with the need to constantly drive. And I believe if we have a city that grows that could be actually then allow us for using more innovation. So that's why I was very excited the last five years to see Las Vegas becoming a hotbed of innovation. And that's all on hold now, of course, unfortunately. But we also have to understand the city cannot endlessly encroach in the precious ecology of the Mojave Desert, which is very, very precious. 100 years ago, we didn't understand that. We this, Terra nullis. It didn't belong to anybody. We ignored indigenous rights and we said this is of no value. It is land to be farmed, to be conquered, and to be earned. As today we know better that this is of extreme precious value and very vulnerable. And we know that sprawl is wasteful in terms of land use and energy use and other resources. And new research shows that sprawl has a negative impact on leading to more isolation, loneliness, depression, and obesity. So we can't treat this precious landscape like many people do. So we, let's identify briefly the key issues, and then I keep flying through some slides, and then we can have some great discussion. What are the issues? The rapid loss of biodiversity is shocking. The species extinction is so hurtful, it's terrible. The eco ecosystem collapse we see in many places around the world, in Asia, in a loss of forest, for instance, uh, in the Amazon. The lack of growth boundaries. We need to protect and conserve the land and say, enough is enough. The footprint of the city cannot grow endlessly. We need a real serious growth boundary that is tight and firm and not what we have at the moment. The social equity and inclusion, of course, that has a lot to do with public space, with poverty, with the lack of affordable housing, the location of jobs at the wrong places, the rising health costs, and so on. Out outdated urbanization models, the zoning laws that haven't changed. We have to have new building codes that haven't been looked at for 20 years that have led to car dependent suburbs and dispersed cities of too low density. So there are new urban models that we've been developing. For instance, density without high rise. We're not talking about high rise buildings. We're talking about three, four story, flexible, appropriate, gentle densification. 
We talk about the city of short distances where people do not have the need to constantly drive because they live and work in the same neighborhood. We talk about the principles of green urbanism that I have coined in the 90s. We talk about the polycentric, not monocentric city. We talk about urban infill and all the benefits that come with urban infill. And we talk about the particular needs and constraints of a hot, arid city like a desert city. We also need to change our mindset. It is something that has been this, um, developed probably in the 17th century by people like Descartes and other philosophers that say humans are superior of nature and nature is just there to be exploited. It's of no other value. Humanity is not dominating nature, but we are part of the same ecosystem that I believe is here um, clearly illustrated in this di diagram. And we need to reverse this ill-informed idea of Descartes. Uh, we also understand that architecture can bring people together, but it can also do the opposite. It can disperse people, uh, as I said earlier. And we have to understand we're not just a desert city like Las Vegas is the only one. We have cities around the world, in Australia, in the Arab Emirates, in Chile, in many other places that are in similar extreme conditions and we can learn from each other and exchange what has worked. We also have traditional solutions in desert cities that are thousands of years old, like here in Yemen, Shimban, where buildings are so close together that they create shading, shaded laneways that are much more heat resilient and I think the key theme for us in research, designing for hot and arid climatic zones, especially given that city of Las Vegas is the fastest warming city in the whole nation of all cities in the US. The second is El Paso, Texas, and I believe Reno is probably number four or five. So we need to connect with other schools of architecture and researchers. And the key challenges for Reno and other cities in Nevada is the excessive urban heat island effect we see uh, we are getting more and more heat waves that are longer and more severe and what's called the urban heat island effect. I'm going to explain in a minute. And also we have warmer nighttime temperatures. It means there's less natural cooling. The city doesn't cool down overnight, which means we need to run even more air conditioning. And the plant that used to be that size is now going to be that size and even bigger, creating more CO2 emissions and needing more energy. The second is the lack of affordable housing. You all know what I'm talking about. The missing middle, the growing cost of living and housing. We need to diversify Las Vegas away and also other cities from tourism and entertainment. We have a much stronger focus on education and knowledge economy, but also we need to deal with homelessness and need to find ways of urban infill of prefabricated offsite manufactured homes, houses that can use sites that are vacant and not used in the city center. So we have, we get more as more out of our, more value out of our existing assets by building up the density where infrastructure already exists instead of building out inside, outside um, of the city and increasing the footprint. The third one is probably mobility, the worsening traffic congestion typical for a dispersed city. We've seen what happened in, La in Los Angeles and the same starts to happen now in other cities in Phoenix and in Las Vegas and in Reno. The car-based urbanism that is simply wrong and we have bought into it in the 50s and 60s and now we know better and we have ways now to get out of that. We have to have transportation that is low carbon, low emission, active transport, new forms of transport. We, we have less air pollution, less noise, and it increases the quality of life because otherwise quality of life keeps declining if we live along those motorways. So after 10 years of debate in Las Vegas, you will know that now the city has finally decided to go towards a bus rapid transit system. I would have loved to see a light railway, but that's not gonna happen. But the bus rapid transit system will be already a good solution. And of course the city has been compact, mixed use walkable for hundreds of years for um, centuries. We need urban infill with three, four-story walk-up buildings. These are good solutions and now those getting more popular and we are looking at building in areas that already developed instead of increasing the footprint of the city further and further. So the answer is neither high-rise nor low-density sprawl. It is what I call density without high buildings. The city of short distances. And there are new good housing models of higher density available, three, four story walk-ups, which can deliver more affordable housing. It brings down the cost and it's the missing middle housing segment 
that has the greatest demand also in Reno. We need, as I mentioned, a growth boundary like other cities like Portland, Oregon have done here, the pink line. And we need to stick towards it that the city grows inwards and gets more compact instead of growing further and further outward and becoming more and bigger and larger in its footprint. That's what I call moving from a monocentric to a polycentric system. The monocentric system has its limits. We have reached it with 2 million people. We now have to think of different, a system of different sub-centers that are interconnected with rapid bus transit, clusters of polycentric cities, not monocentric, that are compact and mixed use. And so you don't have to leave all the time the neighborhood where you live, where you shop, and where you work. We bring shopping, playing, working, and living together, again, to recompact the city, because we have to stop what has happened for the last 60 years, this rampant land, land consumption and loss of agricultural land. Otherwise, we're running into serious trouble with our food security. The land development has quadrupled since 1945 in the US, but the rate of population growth has only been twice of that. So we have a, um, a mismatch here with rampant land consumption that has nothing to do with the population growth directly anymore because our houses became bigger and bigger. And the question is, do we need 4,000, 5,000 square feet houses for two people? if this is the future. So the compact model of the 19th century, much praised, of course, as the most energy efficient model, is of course, all research shows is the, is the model that is uh, having most um, advantages that are listed here, but we can't simply transform the American city to become a European city. It doesn't happen within uh, overnight or within 10 years. And we need to understand the far remote house somewhere outside in the nature, in the desert, is not a solution. If you love nature, don't live in it, don't build in it. We need densities and we need a real city and we, we need to understand the density variation. Densities of at least 30 dwellings per acre, better 50 or 60 dwellings per acre is where we get starting thinking. And we can move those densities in different ways to do mid-rise, low-rise, um, not high-rise, and we have different benefits. And also food production comes in big time because the future supply of our food sources and where we bring community together is very, very important. We see also urban farming as one solution, which I believe is quite valid and has a lot of potential. So housing, how do we want to live? Not like this. We don't want to have monotonous cookie cutter. We want to deliver the missing middle, especially for cities like Reno and Las Vegas, but many others. We need more housing choice. We don't have a choice. We have only the suburban house or inner city apartment. And those two solutions don't uh, suit everybody. We're gonna have to have much better, more interesting design solutions. Uh, like some people have started to look at four or five story where we have interesting uh, ways to live. And uh, this is gonna happen now over the next years. We see it happening in Reno with the reimagined Reno plan, which allows for different housing scenarios, higher densities, which is good. We see the Minneapolis plan, radical urban change, allowing for three units on every lot, doing away with the single house on the lot. And we also see the Los Angeles small lot ordinance, uh, change of the building code that is very good. It's much used at the moment in places like Culver City and Santa Monica and there. It be high quality living spaces where people want to live. At, they take now one lot and they, instead of putting one unit, they're putting four units because now the building code allows it. So we're building more housing uh, in the missing middle and this is probably um, four or five stories, three, four or five story uh, general densification housing. So it makes, it makes housing more affordable because we don't have the land value to pay uh, that is most of the time so expensive, the land, the cost of land. So we need small courtyards for cross ventilation that, we, that allows us to maximize natural lighting. And we need to have, of course, houses solar ready so we can use the rooftops for solar power. And there is, for instance, in Henderson, the district, a series of townhouses where we see living and working and shopping coming together again. It's a modest start and we need to see much more like that. Very successful. More housing choices within one block where we are much more inventive with the roof terraces and roof gardens, like some ideas here. Um, and if we look at cities and study cities that like we've done for many years, 
We see, of course, the traditional cities that are much more walkable and have densities that are not necessarily high rise. And we see the typical car dependent city like Houston here. And this, this is a long discussion. We saw it happening in Europe. Europe is a little bit ahead here in terms of its transformation where people said, it can happen, it cannot happen. They thought it cannot happen. You see the same street here in Amsterdam, it could be Copenhagen, it could be London, where we see streets that were hopelessly given, handed over to the car, car parking and constantly congested and air pollution and noise. And now doing away with the car parking and have light railway and making walking much more pleasant and safe and much wider high quality pedestrian pavings. It's coming down to a couple of um, tricks that um, people are using there where they have high quality um, bluestone paving, for instance, consistent with the urban furniture, wider footpaths, and they're adding flowers and trees and they bring back tree planting. Those things really change cities and people thought it couldn't happen. And it's happening in Australian cities, it's happening in Melbourne, in Adelaide, in Brisbane, in Sydney, in Perth where they have flower stores rented out by city council at a very low lease is one requirement for getting the lease. The flower store has to stay open late and it adds, for instance, to a wonderful urban scenery where you have flower stores. It's increasing the number of sidewalk cafes. 20 years ago in Melbourne, there were two sidewalk cafes. Now there are 500 turning the laneways into great places with cafes and bars for outdoor sitting. And we're gonna talk more about that. So compact cities, compact communities, well interconnected with all the facilities you need for walking. And of course, harnessing solar energy. If we talk about solar energy here in Vegas, always that one example comes up immediately of Mandalay Bay, which is great. It's an enormous roofscape. And so could all the other roofs do? This is just one start. We need to reduce the excessive energy need for air conditioning and lighting. Those casinos have, and we're talking to those companies uh, that own those hotels and casinos about the casino of the 21st century that is run by solar energy, that has daylight, that is a completely different situation. It's, uh, it's a healthy environment, more healthy environment. So it's helping us to create a vision for the new Vegas as the strip will open next week. And this is the outdated, out, outdated model we see here. The city that is completely car dependent, I wouldn't even call this a city, it's a business park where you arrive only with your car, there's not one tree on that car park, and the building is a complete, completely glazed glass box, looks the same all the way, north, south, east, west, doesn't make sense. It's got a huge air conditioned plant on the roof, you can't open the windows. So this is what is a consequence of cheap fossil fuel and not caring. And this is the outdated model that is over, that's finished. Now talking quickly about extreme heat, we're suffering in the Southwest here, where people say this area could become uninhabitable at the end of the century. Um, I spoke about the urban heat island, uh, which is a nighttime problem where we see the difference of temperature between the urban core and the fringe the low density sprawl that is cooler always because it has more green space. And we need to bring the green space to the city center by having all those roofs green and the space in between the buildings. And we should not rush into blindly into higher densities. We have to understand the dangerous interplay between moving towards higher densities and the threat of increase of herb, urban heat island. So we have to be smart about that and there are solutions about how to do this as we need to keep cities cooler. We have to make sure we re-green and re-nature those higher density cities like Singapore and other cities. So we'll have done it very well. Of course, we wanna keep places, spaces like Central Park in New York that is crucial to keep the city cool. So we need to protect the residents from extreme heat. I mean, we are working with government to found solutions for this, how to do it, and what is, of course, the worst scenario is black buildings, black roofs, black tiles. As we see more heat waves, we will see much higher temperature inside those buildings. We're mapping the heat and we did the largest comparative study of Australian cities. We learned a lot from that. We were looking now at cities like uh, Phoenix and Las Vegas. We see, for instance, in Las Vegas, an increase five-fold of the deaths rate, heat-related deaths, have increased sharply in the last five to six years, uh, and in Arizona tripled 
because this is increasing the temperatures that people work in outdoors, people working outdoors, but also the homeless or sick people in, um, um, in uh, bound to bed, the elderly or children uh, in kindergartens. So this is the silent killer. Another silent killer we have to deal with is a very serious issue here uh, in future. So what can be done? We can use the, what's called the albedo effect, increase the reflective capacity of materials, of roofs and facades to keep them cool. And is there are new materials, new nanotechnology um, research, developing new materials that doesn't store the heat and doesn't become like a trapping heat baking oven. It doesn't turn the city into a baking oven. An integration of urban greenery, green roofs and vegetation, planting urban forests is very good for keeping cities cool. And of course, those trees also absorb CO2. So we need to reduce the heat load with natural cross ventilation that allows us to have smaller air conditioned plants. Uh, we also need to be smarter about the green roofs that are designed with native plants, with water saving on mind and understand the ecosystem services that nature delivers those parks and gardens. Here's an interesting graph about the albedo effect. We see for instance, a black asphalt car park is probably the worst. It has almost no albedo, 0.04 is the reflective code, whereas a green grass roof lawn or green roof is much better uh, with 0 0.3, 0 0.5 sometimes. So we need to do this. I mean, to increase the density along transit corridors, like we've been consulting, I've been working the last 10 years with the city of Helsinki in Finland, where we link where people, population growth happens, where people move with public transport and we accommodate the new population in four, five, six story buildings in Helsinki along its medium density, along the transit routes and corridors of those train, around train railway stations so people can easily commute um, close walking distance to those railway stations, not dependent on the cars. We've done the same in Sydney, where we worked, uh, worked with the government, New South Wales, of higher medium density along railway corridors and railway crossings over the last years. And the secret is to build on the existing infrastructure that is already there. So when you have a tram line or a bus line, this is where you put the population density around these transit corridors. You can get much more efficiency out of the same infrastructure and you need to accommodate the new population of growing cities in inner city medium density walk-ups, three, four story along Maryland Parkway is already happening here in Vegas, along the transit routes through urban infill. And we only use here, by doing this, we would only use 5% of the land of the city to accommodate the growth, which means we can leave the other 95% of the existing suburbs untouched. And these suburbs then can plant trees. So it's neither high rise, nor suburban sprawl, it's the flexible density without high rise, the density that can, can provide amenities. So summary of my talk, I hope you found it interesting. There's a lot more to talk about, of course, but what are the key strategies you will ask? Okay, there's a lot coming together and it's complex and it's all interconnected and there's not one simple bullet, there's not one simple simplistic formula or solution and we can, we, we can do uh, a multiplicity of things at the same time. In fact, we have to do it to transform our existing cities. Um, that means to get more out of our, set, our assets. And of course, changing mindset and behavior, we need to change if we want a sustainable city. Old mentalities have to give way. What is missing is the, also the political will and the leadership. That's why I created the Leadership Institute for Future Cities, because the number one barrier I found is not Technology. Technology is available and becoming more and more affordable. I also found the designers are doing a great job. They're learning and they're getting much better in offering those design solutions. But it doesn't happen. The transformation still doesn't happen because uh, there is enough technology, there's enough design, there is enough money, but the mindset, the behavior and the leadership, the political will in those governments is not there. That's the number one. So summary for what I spoke about, and I, I know it's a lot. Land use, develop compact mixed use neighborhoods with walkable access to chop, putting chops where people live and putting people living where the chops are, amenities and access to transit. 
by walking. That would be ideal. Bringing work, working and living together again after trying to separate it out for 60, 70 years. These functions belong to each other. It's the end of what was the Charta of Athens, the outdated model from the 1940s, 50s. And now focus on new development as infill and redevelopment those areas along transit corridors and building design is very important here. We need to ensure all buildings have vegetated roofs, higher standards, higher codes, for instance, using materials that doesn't store and trap heat. We can't have concrete roofs become, becoming like baking ovens. We need to use the albedo. We need to plant roofs uh, with uh, native plants. Um, safe water, of course, and we have to have strategic orientation of buildings and placement of windows. We also have to think of the public space, the open space now with COVID-19. We need to protect and enhance and restore those natural features and stop encroaching and increasing the city into the desert, into the precious landscape and into farmland and forest. We need to reduce the water consumption, of course, and act stronger, even stronger water conservation strategies because we're running out of water here and we minimize the consumptive water use, and we need to develop new park and open space topologies for new exist and existing development, providing continuous shading is very important for people here uh, in the heat to walk and to cycle, continuously shaded, and we need to prioritize the increasing tree canopy. We need to have the right type of native trees with large leaves and canopies, across the city for multiple public health and environmental benefits. And last but not least, we need to use technology and infrastructure in the best way we can by prioritizing the use of renewable energy sources, especially solar power here. It's a no brainer, I believe in Southern Nevada, also in Reno where we have so much radiation from the sun, which is for free. We should run the whole city, turn it into a decentralized power station where every building creates its own energy and even more feedback into the grid, into a smart grid. We need to connect and enhance accessible bike and pedestrian facilities throughout the city. So biking becomes more fun, more pleasant and walking and maybe e-bikes, electric bikes. There is a huge possibility, I believe, in electric bikes and increase transportation choice, make transit options more convenient and better integrated with vibrant neighborhood centers. And these are my strategies as a summary. And let me quote to end French philosopher Bruno Latour, who said last week, he's, he's, he's sitting in Paris at home in his apartment in Paris, and he can't get out because of COVID-19. And he was thinking about, and he's a great singer, and he urges us to not return to the pre-lockdown normal. He asks to resist the return to the old ways, to the business as usual, and he says, when people say we cannot do anything about climate change, it's clearly wrong. People realize that things are possible and they were told those things are impossible. And that creates a huge opportunity now for us at the moment because fast change in thinking by politicians and citizens is possible as we have seen over the recent three months. It is possible and we have to have an optimistic lookout. And so, this brings me to the point where I'm happy to take your questions. And I spoke 30 or 40 minutes, and it's a great pleasure to be here. So please ask me whatever you like to ask. And I mute my microphone now. Thank you so much, Stefan. Um, I'm Megan Collins from DRI. I'm going to be moderating the Q&A. That was really thoughtful. You gave the audience a lot of ideas on which I think they're going to have some interesting questions. So we'll wait for the audience to enter those questions in the comment box. I'm going to start you off with one. Um, when our team first met you, you struck me as somebody who was really imaginative and who could recognize novel ideas. And so I'm curious, among the promising practices that you described to us, what do you think is the most imaginative and novel promising practice for sustainable cities of the future. Thanks, it's a great idea, uh, great question. And um, so what are the three most interesting innovations that could make a difference in terms of the future of the city? And um, I believe um, there are new ways now to think about density, obviously. Uh, we, we've known for a long time that walkable mixed-use neighborhoods are better, but now we have innovation in urban infill using uh, prefabricated 
off-site manufactured small micro housing and housing that uses sites and spaces uh, behind and in backyards and on, on top of garages and places where we didn't think before that would be, it'd be great to put a two or three story building. So we have prefabrication of site manufacturing. It is really innovation. That's a great innovation that helps us to do urban infill in a very interesting, fun way. Okay. Then the second one, uh, I mean, um, cities will be around a long time. You know, if what we build now is probably around for 50 uh, or, or 100 years, you know, so we need a very good plan. We have to have a very good plan. And I believe another innovation for that is new materials that avoid the storage of heat. I spoke about that already because of the dangerous urban heat island effect that is increasing everywhere in the world in the cities that are exposed to more and more to global warming. And so we need materials, so-called cool materials. And there's a lot of great very cutting edge innovation coming, scientific innovation coming from nanotechnology, nanotechnology materials that create a surface where, this, where the materials do not heat up and store, but they don't absorb, but they reflect uh, there is solar radiation. So there's less solar radiation, less solar gain, meaning less heat load that we have to cool down. And the third innovation I'm thinking uh, that is really uh, remarkable and I would like to mention is uh, of course, the renewable energy sector. I mean, solar power has been laughed at 50 years, 40 years ago. It's been around a long time, but now it's different. The photovoltaic panels and there are different technologies there that are now made are very affordable. The price has come down significantly. They cost now, now like only 10% of what they used to cost 20 years ago. And they have, the, the manufacturers are giving guarantees of 30 years. Um, it's very efficient. They have. They have uh, very high efficiencies of 25, 30% efficiency, and they don't lose their efficiency after a year. So there has a lot of great new technology in the different um, types of um, solar photovoltaic um, panels that are now available at a very affordable price. So I think those are three great innovations and we could talk about much more, of course, social innovation, social infrastructure, social innovation is the most exciting, of course, uh, also. But uh, if you ask me about technical innovation, yeah. Thanks for that question, it's great. Before we turn to the questions from the community, I have one, uh, one clarification question for you. You mentioned that there's this concept called the missing middle and that there are housing strategies, design strategies to fill in the missing middle. Is that a strategy that can help address the challenges of, of rising housing costs and gentrification that we're seeing in a lot of cities today? Well, the missing middle is neither cheap and nasty, low cost affordable. <laughs> that, you know, we also have to do, not hopefully not so nasty, but you know, we have to get the homeless into shelter and so on. And it's also uh, not the high luxury end penthouse or 5,000 square feet uh, house somewhere remote out in the landscape where we shouldn't build at all. So it's neither one or the other. Um, we have to understand that the missing middle is where we haven't really provided. Um, and that comes back to, the, to my developer friends <laughs> that are offering again and again the same no risk real estate product again and again, because they know that's where they get their 12 to 15% um, profit margin and the banks know it and the banks are feel comfortable because they say oh this is low risk let's do another suburb roll out the carpet here and uh, we've done it thousands of times hundreds of times and they finance that so the banks and the developers keep doing the same model and one reason for that is also because the consumer the client uh, the buyer of those houses doesn't ask for better and doesn't ask for more choice we're gonna have to say hang on uh, we can can do better and I've traveled and I've seen this and this in Scandinavia or this and this in Portland or this and this in San Francisco suburbs and it's great and there's new ways to live together and maybe share a garden or maybe you know it's three four story maybe it's new types of interesting fun typologies of duplex and uh, um, it's neither apartment nor townhouse it's a kind of hybrid mix that we have to come up with and important is as we move to those medium density, gentle densification infill models that we work out overshading. We can't overshade the neighbor, but 
uh, and also we work out privacy. And this is where the designer comes in, the architect, and they have to provide this missing middle segment that there is a market and people are asking for it. And this is, let's say, a house of $400,000 that is the median price uh, uh, already anyway, and we know even more. And so, um, so this is where, where we have to ask for better design, better models, uh, and, and you see the other uh, idea I have is, at the moment, all those houses that I've seen recently in those uh, new built suburbs, they all have a major big garage. They have a three car garage door. And the first thing, the only thing, in fact, you see from the house is the garage door. <laughs> it's a massive garage door. And that is creating the aesthetic of the house. I mean, come on, we can do better. We used to have houses in the US that had a beautiful porch. And, you know, we can do the driveway in the way that the garage is kind of set uh, on the side. And maybe you drive through and you park behind. And it's not just all about the big garage door, what the house looks like, the big garage door. You know, this is coming down to the aesthetics also. I mean, we have to do many things. We have to be thinking about energy efficiency, about the cost, about the innovation, about the new materials, about the aesthetics, architecture, it's an all-encompassing art form. And that's why it contributes so much to culture. And, and cities are probably humanity's biggest achievement. They're gonna last for a long, long time. You know, and now you're gonna have to ask for better models. It's time now. And that's also involving the missing middle because this is where most people are that can afford a better house, but they don't because they, they keep getting offered those limited choices and the same product and this needs to change. We need to see the change. Thank you for empowering the consumer to ask for more. I appreciate that. Let's turn to the DRI community. Do we have any questions from the DRI Facebook group? Hi, we do. We have a number of great questions. I'll try to get to all of them. Um, I'm going to start by asking the latest one that just came in. Um, because it relates to our kind of climate concerns in Nevada, particularly Southern Nevada. So Sarah asks, how compatible are, the concept, are these concepts with safely accommodating building in flood prone areas? Um, how can we build lower flood risk and, and um, prevent urban sprawl slash hot city centers? Yeah, great question again. And some of it is repeating what I spoke earlier about. I mean, uh, um, flooding, flood prone areas, um, that's a big issue because we're going to see more urban flooding. As we see more urban heat island, we also see more urban flooding because we have sometimes less rain, but when it rains, it really rains and it floods. And you know, uh, uh, these are the impacts of global warming and the climate change. And we're going to see that in many places. So I understand that that's a particularly important uh, issue for the city of Reno, where um, uh, people look at building in flood prone areas. Of course, we can do buildings on stilts. We can do buildings on columns that are raised and where the flood can come and go. But, you know, that creates higher construction costs and it disconnects the inhabitants from the garden if it's not done well. It needs to be done well. And so um, I think there are interesting ideas about uh, urban flooding and those kind of new ideas of having buildings up in the air and so let the flooding come, it doesn't matter. But of course, it's not, it's just, uh, it's retreat. Uh, we can also actively uh, um, attack the idea, or we can think of not building in those flood prone areas. Maybe there is uh, something wrong and we have to have another look at those uh, areas. Uh, why are they flooding? And uh, maybe it's not where we should build because there might be better uh, wetland, a constructed wetland that uses the flooding, the regular flooding as a bird habitat um, and as a big green constructed wetland that deals with urban heat islands, uh, which the city also needs. And rather in building in flood prone areas, I think we should rather build in already built up areas where there is no flood risk. It's much better, much smarter and have three, four story walk ups. Yeah, I hope that uh, I know, I'm realizing we're running out of time soon. Let's go to another question. Great. Are there any questions from the discovery community? Yeah, we have a couple of them. Here's, here's one that actually uh, I think is very timely 
from Robin. She asks, uh, for those of us wondering about the future of workspaces in the next normal, what innovation trends do you see coming out of the COVID-19 response? Yeah, another, can you hear me? Another great question. I mean, obviously, um, this new normal, you know, how we going to work in future. We need new housing typologies where the home office, not just for one person, but if it's a household of three, four people, they're all going to need a home office. <laughs> like here, I'm talking to you today from my home office, from my living room here in Las Vegas. You know, we need those houses that are completely resort. We need houses with, win with windows that connect to the street, that allow us to step out. Small balconies already make a big difference. We saw this in some cities like Milan and Berlin and uh, Paris, but also here in the US, of course, where we had at home long. And those people that were stuck in tiny micro apartments without any balcony, you know, kind of cheap uh, made inner city stuff that hasn't really sought about any quality, you know, there's no reason why we shouldn't have higher density with balconies and with an access to a roof garden that is a shared garden space, for instance, or also uh, a plan, a more innovative housing typology plan that allows for three, four people, part of the household, each of them to sit separately and concentrate and do Zoom meetings or WebEx meetings separately without interfering. And those kind of home office typologies will be very interesting because in future home offices will stay with us much longer. They won't go completely away. Uh, we, will not, we will not all rush back. I mean, at the moment, for instance, my university, the campus is closed. Everybody is working from home. 4,000 staff and faculty and 31,000 students are working from home. And some students are struggling because they have no home office, they have no internet connection or very slow internet connection. It's been a major problem. So the, the digitization we've been talking about and the home office has become accelerated in the last three months. Like we, nobody of us could expect in January, February, suddenly we had to do it, we were forced to. And now we're gonna see at architects and their design strategies for a post COVID-19 world where we're gonna see much smarter thinking about homes and uh, accommodating working from home. This is gonna stay with us much longer. I hope those new home offices uh, have plenty of space for the furry coworkers that we've been meeting. <laughs> All right, I recognize we're over time, but I, I do want to see if we have one more question from the DRI community. Do you think there's one we could answer in a, in a short amount of time, Jack? I do. So we have a number of great questions here, but I'll just pick one that is short and sweet. Um, so Elizabeth asks, what do you think is the most livable U.S. city and why? Did you say short and sweet? <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, I love them all and they are wonderful. I mean, you know, Chicago is great because of its urbanity. And I love Los Angeles. And people would say, oh, there are more, more cars than people in Los Angeles. <laughs> but, you know, it's kind of exciting, the energy of the people. I love Las Vegas, the energy of the people. And the light is wonderful, you know. And uh, I love uh, many cities. I love... Uh, um, I love, of course, New York, but New York is New York and it's not US. You see, I think there is the United States and then there is New York City. And this, <laughs> this is not the same, you know, New York has its own uh, attraction, just the atmosphere of walking around and taking the subway and going to Central Park uh, is just amazing and the museums and so. So there are many cities I love, you know, and I like, I like one particular city I like very much. So maybe to answer the question, I actually, actually like San Diego very much. Uh, I, I think San Diego is fantastic because it's not too large like Los Angeles. It's got great atmosphere, a, a very Hispanic influence. It's got great food. Uh, people are wonderful and the beaches are just first, first class. You know, you can go over the bridge and, uh, uh, and, and, and go to those white beaches and you have a city with a beach. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's always very attractive, you know. And, and the way San Diego is now developing is very exciting. So I think they're doing some interesting work there with higher density housing in the downtown area. And uh, I know a lot is happening this way now with a new master plan we are working on here in Las Vegas. 
we're going to see also similar action coming soon. But there are, I, I mean, I love them all. I like New Orleans uh, and so on. So I don't want to I want to talk, uh, mention more cities, but, but these are my favorites probably. And uh, I think San Diego has got a lot of going for me. Yeah. <laughs> Izzy, how you'd love San Diego if you loved Sydney. So, great.